thank you so much. Uh, really excited to talk about my work today. So we're constantly making decisions, and these include very mundane decisions like what am I going to eat for dinner tonight, and also really fundamental decisions like who are my friends and who are my enemies. So I think one of the big questions in neuroscience is how do we, how do we make good decisions? And a lot of what we know about how we make good decisions comes from the textbook view of dopamine neurons in a brain region called the VTA, as encoding a reward prediction error. In other words, they respond when there's an unexpected reward or an unexpected stimulus that predicts reward, but not when the reward is expected. And this has been such an influential discovery because this prediction error signal is central to reinforcement learning algorithms. And then therefore it's led to really clear ideas about how reinforcement learning circuitry can be mapped onto the brain. And in particular, this is a kind of cartoon of the general idea, which is that you have dopamine neurons that encode these reward prediction errors, and then they project to the striatum where they reweight cortical inputs that encode the state of the world uh, to produce these striatal neurons that encode the value of that state. In other words, how much reward could be predicted from that state. And the reason that's so useful is you, if you have neurons that encode value or predicted reward, then you can make good decisions because you can choose the thing that's highest value. And so this has been a really influential model and there's been lots of different types of evidence to support it including the fact that dopamine does indeed reweight corticostriatal synapses and that it can mediate synaptic plasticity and also optogenetics that if you can activate or inhibit dopamine neurons that can be necessary and sufficient for reinforcement learning. Uh, but in what I wanna point out is that in recent years, this model has been under a lot of pressure and has, there's been a lot of increasing skepticism. And one of the main reasons I would argue for that is that kind of contradicting one of the core tenets of this model, which is the scalar reward prediction error, there's been evidence for unexpected heterogeneity in the dopamine system. And just to give a few examples from my lab, we found differences across projections where dopamine neurons that project to dorsal striatum have a motor signal that's not as evident in neurons that project to the ventral striatum. We've also seen heterogeneity across neurons, where when looking at individual neurons during a decision-making task, many neurons have different tuning to different behavioral variables during the task. And we've also seen differences in terms of the causal effects, where when we manipulate different subpopulations of dopamine neurons, they affect behavior on different timescales. So I think a big question for the field is how do we reconcile this heterogeneity with the really compelling understanding of this system as mediating reinforcement learning. So that's what I wanna talk about in the first part of my talk today. And particu in particular, I'm gonna go into a little bit of detail on this published data and then tell you how we're thinking about how it could be reconciled with ideas about reinforcement learning. So in this task, and it's actually a task that several of our labs are using at Princeton and uh, Tim Barron's actually already introduced, there is a mouse running down a virtual corridor, seeing towers on either the left or the right, and they get rewarded for turning to the side with more towers. So they have to basically accumulate evidence and turn to the side with more towers. And in the context of this task, we image from populations of dopamine neurons in the VTA using an implanted grid lens and two photon imaging and found really a huge amount and really surprising level of heterogeneity at the single cell level, where individual neurons may have been tuned to position or different kinematic parameters or separately tuned for cues on the left or right, or the accuracy of the mouse in the task and other variables during when they're actually making the decision in the central stem of the maze. But in, in contrast to this heterogeneity, in the outcome period, when they got to the end, almost all neurons responded in this classic manner of responding to the reward, very similar to a reward prediction error model. And this is a summary of the data where this is how much these different behavioral variables, task variables contributed to neural, all the neural activity on this axis. And you can see different neurons tended to be tuned to different ones of these behavioral variables, but almost all of these clusters of neurons responded to reward. 
So how do, can we reconcile this heterogeneity with this model I introduced on the first slide of the scalar prediction error model? And so what I want to suggest right now is work in collaboration with Rachel Lee and Nathaniel Da on a new mapping between these reinforcement, this concept of reinforcement learning and brain circuitry, which is a vector model. And the idea where basically the idea is now dopamine is a vector where different subsets of dopamine neurons are still calculating reward prediction errors based on the inputs they're receiving from the striatal and cortical neurons, but they're, they're calculating these prediction errors based on this, a subset of this representation. So if different cortical neurons encode different features of the world, such as the cues or the velocity, then different striatal neurons would be calculating the value or predicted, predicted reward just based on the subset of features, and then project that onto only subsets of dopamine neurons so that each dopamine neuron is calculating a prediction error only based on a subset of the feature space, but this can then get recombined at the level of striatum in as much as dopamine might mix at the target site. So what I wanna do now is show you that this model seems to be able to recapitulate a lot of our data and then tell you a little bit about what some of the implications of this new model might be. So in order to simulate this model and see if we can recapitulate our data, we need a way to create a state representation and a, and a vector of values from this task. And so for this, we can really take advantage of the fact this is a task in virtual reality. So we can train an artificial reinforcement learning agent to do the same task that the mice did. So here is the agent doing the task and getting screens of the um, visual environment that then get passed through a convolutional neural network and then into a basically a reinforcement learning agent that both selects an action and also calculates from these same features it computed, it calculates values and a vector of reward prediction errors, which are then in turn used to train the network. This here, I'm showing you that this works and that the agent learns to do the task. This is the agent running down the maze and seeing more cues on the left and then ultimately turning left. And now I'm going to show you the record, the analysis of the neural activity across this vector of reward prediction errors. And the um, first thing to see is that it recapitulates the heterogeneity we see in the neurons, just because these, because these different modeled neurons are getting these different inputs, different parts of the value representation, they are tuned to different features, like different view angles or different positions and also different cues. Some may be tuned to cues on the left, those towers on the left, and others to the towers on the right. And apart from, in, in addition to re recapitulating the data, the model also makes some, uh, some predictions that we can test. And one is that this heterogeneity isn't just heterogeneity uh, about just, it's not just the sensory inputs themselves, but it's actually reward prediction errors with respect to subsets of that feature representation. So what I mean by that is these neurons that are responding to cues might not be responding merely to the presence of a cue, but whether or not that, not that cue tells them they're more likely versus less likely to get reward. In other words, an error in the prediction of reward with respect to that subset of the entire feature representation. So to make that more concrete, if you think about a particular trial, you, uh, any cue will tell you, will confirm that you're more likely to get reward. Like as the mouse is coming along, it gets this cue, it's on the si same side as the previous cue. So now it means reward, it's confirming that reward is in indeed gonna be on that side and it's reward probability increase. So this is a positive prediction error with respect to cues. Whereas these cues you could consider disconfirmatory. Now rewards getting less likely because it's bringing the count back down to zero. There had been two rewards on the right and now there's a reward on the left and another on the left. And now things are 50-50 about if the mouse will get rewarded. And so the agent, because it was it's a reinforcement learning agent that's literally calculating reward prediction errors with respect to these features, acts as we'd expect has a stronger response on average when a cue is confirming reward than disconfirming reward. And a, what's really cool is a similar uh, perspective emerges from looking at the dopamine data, where the, where, which really again suggests that these responses to cues aren't merely just sensory responses, but actually 
uh, since it's a response to the confirmatory versus the disconfirmatory cues, it suggests it's a response to the reward predicting ability of this specific subset of the features that the mouse can be using to do the task. And the other kind of key finding of the neural data that uh, was that all of the, or almost all of the neurons responded to reward. And this is something that the model can of course also accomplish because the, the vector of RPE, the vector of dopamine neurons is all calcul is calculating reward prediction error. So they all do get a reward input to do this. So what, I'm, what I've shown you so far is that this modification of this classic model, which allows different dopamine neurons to calculate reward prediction errors based on different subsets of the feature space, is able to basically recapitulate the key findings of our data, heterogeneity in the dopamine response during decision-making, but still recover the homogeneity in the response to reward. It also makes, I think, some interesting implications that we're really just in the beginning of thinking about in testing, which is basically that as you change how an animal is doing a task or what its goals are or what features are being used to predict reward, that should make very predictable changes in this vector of reward prediction errors, which is something that has yet to be tested. And um, a related thing that we're really interested in is the idea that it will also reflect what an individual is doing. So different individuals can take different strategies or have different goals or predict rewards based on different features of the environment. And those different individuals should therefore have different dopamine responses that correspond to their individual behavioral strategy. So the last part that thing I wanna tell you about this story is us starting to think about that. Namely, does the heterogeneity in dopamine across individuals, is it consistent with, I, with what I just suggested? Is it consistent with the features that each individual is using to predict reward? In other words, that individual's behavioral strategy. And this is work in collaboration with a really talented graduate student, Lindsay Wilmore, who's co-advised by Annegret Faulkner. And for this, I'm going to switch gears to tell you about a study that we've been doing in the context of chronic stress, where, which I think is a very relevant and uh, important scenario and also interesting in that when, when we're exposed to stress, there's very much a lot of divergence and individual differences in terms of outcome, where some end up with psychiatric symptoms in response to chronic stress and others are resilient. And this is something that is very obvious in the human population, but it's also true in mice. And a mouse model for this is something you may have already heard of, which is the chronic social defeat stress model, where mice get repeated exposure across about 10 days to an aggressor mouse. And then this defeated mouse uh, gets this experience for five minutes a day, and then a new aggressor every day. And then at the end of 10 days, some mice are resilient. They don't show any like depression or anxiety like or antisocial behavior and then others are susceptible they show antisocial behavior and other uh, seemingly maladaptive behaviors so what our question is what do resilient mice do differently and that could that relate to the individual differences in their representations in the dopamine system and so here, oh, to try to understand what they do differently, we actually have to quantify some, which, what, which actually has never been done before, what the behaviors are that the mice do during these social encounters, during these social experiences. So to do this, Lindsay recorded the mouse's behavior and tracked it with deep lab cut from these like two different orientations, and then uh, turn these turn these track joints into some intuitive feature representations based on angles and distances between mice and proximity and so on. And then embedded this 12 dimensional space into two dimensions and identified clusters based on the high density locations within this two dimensional embedding. And what, uh, so the first question is, what are the resilient mice doing during this stress from the susceptible mice? Are they taking a different strategy? And so here I'm showing you the clusters that differ between the resilient and susceptible mice. And the answer is yes, there's different cluster occupancies between susceptible and resilient mice. So for example, this uh, cluster is more purple, which means it's stronger in the resilient mice. This one's more green, which means it's stronger in the susceptible mice. 
and across the um, across these clusters, you can predict whether mouse will ultimately be resilient or susceptible based on these cluster occupancies, which means resilient and susceptible mice are taking different behavioral strategies during the feed, and that's predictive of whether or not they'll be resilient or not. And then what, what actually are they doing differently? Well, one of the clusters that's most different is this cluster number one here. And this maybe perhaps intuitively is actually the defeated mouse fighting back when it gets attacked. So the mice that tend to fight back more when they get attacked seem to be the ones that are resilient. And so does this, does this get reflected in their dopamine system? Is dopamine heterogeneity across individuals a reflection of their kind of strategy? And the answer is yes. If you look, it's actually a very strong result. Basically, the resilient mice have a response in the dopamine system when they fight back, whereas the susceptible mice that have that as a less preferred strategy do not. So this is, I think, a really good indication that maybe differences across individuals and their behavioral strategies, which may be predictive of their end outcome, are, are reflected in heterogeneity in the dopamine system across individuals. So to conclude this first half of the talk, what we think is that dopamine neurons can be very heterogeneous, especially in high dimensional tasks where there's multiple features of the environment that can be used to predict reward. And we think this heterogeneity, at least in part, may, may actually reflect the features that are being used by any individual at any given point in time to predict reward. And this might be an interesting window into understanding differences across individuals. So for the second part of the talk, I wanted to talk about how behavioral strategies could change across time and if different strategies might have different underlying circuit mechanisms. And this is work by a really talented postdoc, Scott Vulcan, and also Iris Stone, who's a terrific grad student who's co-advised by Jonathan Pillow. And in this part of the talk, instead of focusing on the dopamine neurons, which was the first half, I'll instead be talking about the striatal neurons. And as a little bit of background, the striatum is composed of two principal output pathways, the direct and the indirect pathway. And the classic view is that the striatal pathways oppositely modulate behavior. The direct pathway is called the go pathway. It's supposed to make the mouse go or make a human go. And the indirect pathway is instead thought to suppress behavior. It's the no-go pathway. And there's really been a lot of studies in the last uh, decade or so supporting this classic view, many of which showed support by, oops, by optogenetically activating the direct and indirect pathway and getting an animal to go or not go. But at the same time, there's been really, really surprisingly few, actually, if any, reports of pathway-specific inhibition, which have led to some doubts about if this model is correct or at least if it's complete. And there also at the same time have been various studies that either from recordings or from activation have actually contradicted the classic view. So I think that has, at least for us, left open the question like, is this idea correct of thinking about these pathways as go and no go? And why, and more simply put, why is it that you can't, people haven't really seen an effect when they inhibit these pathways during behavior? And so to address this, we simply wanted to inhibit the pathways during behavior and understanding, understand when and why they contribute. So to do this, we optically inhibited the pathways. This is just showing you some confirmation that it works to inhibit the pathways. Uh, because there's been some thoughts that maybe the reason no one's reported effects of inhibition is inhibition simply doesn't work in these neurons, but it does work. And so the first thing we did was see that you actually don't find a mouse goes or doesn't go if you inhibit the two pathways. In fact, we didn't see any effect on movement when the mouse was simply running in a two-dimensional corridor. So we just had mice running in a corridor where they could move, like change their orientation and go forward. Uh, or backwards, they could do anything they wanted, but if they ran to the end, they'd get a reward. And when we had mice do this and we recorded from the neurons, nothing happened. So when, we, I mean, sorry, when we inhibited the direct and indirect pathway, the black is control trials and the green are inhibition of the indirect pathway or the direct pathway or the control trials. And as you can see, they all look really the same. That's for the velocity of the mouse as a function of the position down the maze. Similarly, the X position, like transverse movement didn't change. 
the view angle didn't change and also kind of how directed they were in their movement didn't change. So really nothing happened in terms of movement, which seemed to go kind of at least on, on some level against the idea that these two pathways are the like promote and suppress movement. But it does go along with the idea that no one has really reported any effects from inhibiting these pathways. So we, want the, so we wanted to explore the hypothesis, and I think it's very much aligned with the symposium on co cognition, that perhaps the contribution of these pathways is not directly to movement, but more about the decision-making or cognition that might underlie the process of figuring out where you want to move. And to do this, we compared different decision-making tasks that had very had the exact same motor features, like the same maze, but just slightly different uh, changes that cause differences in cognitive demands. So the first was the accumulation of evidence task, which I had just told you about. The next is a control task where there is, it's slightly easier cognitively because there's no distractors. So rather than accumulating evidence, any cue tells the mouse with total certainty which side they have to turn. And then the next maze is this exactly like the accumulating evidence task, but the cues are not just transiently available, they're permanently available, which also makes the task easier for the mouse because they just don't have to remember the cues for as long. So basically these tasks, I'm gonna argue, have different cognitive demands. And to support that, here's how well the mice perform across tasks. And they're much less accurate in the more cognitively demanding tasks, the evidence accumulation tasks compared to the control tasks. Uh, but I wanna emphasize that they have the exact same motor requirements. And like from a sensory perspective, while they're not identical, they're very, very similar. These are kind of screenshots across different positions of the same maze. And so what we found is really huge effects of inhibition, like very much unlike that linear track, really enormous effects of inhibition in that evidence accumulation task. And moreover, these effects were in opposite directions where indirect pathway inhibition led to a contralateral bias and direct led to an ipsilateral bias. So really, so it goes along with, so basically this goes along with the idea that these two populations have opposite roles in behavior, but it seems like it might be really specific to the cognition or the decision-making aspect of behavior. And consistent with that interpretation, the control tasks, which again, really only differed in their cognitive demand had basically zero effect of the manipulation. So this, again, we think suggests that the striatal pathways do obviously control the decision, particularly cognitively demanding decisions, but they don't have a direct effect on movement in the absence of some like cognitive demand. And now what I want to tell you about is, uh, is thinking about if these, this contribution of the striatum and actually the strategy the mice take, if it's constant or does it change across time? And to answer this question, we used a hidden Markov model with, G with GLM or logistic regression observations. So what this means is that we model decisions based on inputs like the difference in towers or the difference in cues, the whether or not there's a laser, what the mouse did on the previous trials and use these inputs to predict the animal's choice. However, there, the, this weighting, this GLM that was used to predict choice wasn't always the same. There was a hidden Markov model that controlled which GLM was being used to predict choice. And these different uh, latent states changed with some fixed probability P. So this meant that animals or the model could basically learn different states with different GLM weights so that it could uncover different decision-making strategies with different weighting on these external covariates and also the effect of the laser. So in other words, the effect of the brain manipulation on the decision. And what we found I think was really surprising and uh, which is that while well, there are different states with different strategies and also different effects of DMS inhibition. So here is the first state that I'm showing you where there is, there were this state, they're really good at the ta task. They're doing what they're supposed to. There's a big weighting on the difference in the towers. There's actually a relatively small weighting on the laser, so they aren't hugely affected by DMS inhibition, and they're not affected by these sort of things they're not supposed to be using, like their previous choices or their previous reward. And this is what their psychometric curve looks like in the state, which you can see they have really good uh, performance in that they don't really lapse a lot of the edges, 
uh, in terms of the no laser trials, and then there's the control trials, and there's only a small effective laser. And here you can see that overall the performance is pretty good in this state. Then they will also transition to this other state where the weighting on the towers is much lower. They're not doing the task as well. And instead, they're paying attention to these previous choices and things they're not supposed to be to do the task. Like what they did repeating, this basically means they're repeating their previous choices rather than paying attention to the towers. And so you can see there's a really bad psychometric curve, very flat and a very small effect of the laser again, or pretty modest effect of the laser and really bad performance is about a chance. And then I think what really, was really exciting and surprising to us is this: there was also a state that was discovered where the performance was pretty good, similar, almost as strong when waiting on towers, but instead a huge effect of the laser, uh, meaning that in this state, Basically, their decision was almost on the light off trials are pretty similar to in the state one, but when the light was on and we're inhibiting the DMS, their decision was almost completely dictated by the that laser, which caused like a huge bias, either contralateral for the indirect pathway and ipsilateral for the direct pathway. So, so these um, states were actually very persistent. They had a very high uh, chance of returning, staying in the same state they were in although they did often visit multiple states in the session. So that is the summary of or the summary of the second half is that we don't think that these pathways in the dorsal striatum uh, necessarily directly control movement. We think they can provide opposing contribution to behavior, but it really depends on cognition, both the cognitive demands of the task, as we showed really only the most cognitively demanding task involves this striatal dependence. And probably most remarkably, even within that task, it depends really heavily on the cognitive state where mice actually may or may not be occupying a state, a cognitive state, as you might call it, with a strong dependence on these pathways. And presumably they can also do the task using other pathways in other parts of the brain. So we're now in the process and very excited about following up the study by actually recording the neural correlates of this task across these different states. And we think this is probably, we think probably this dependence of behavior on state is probably not something specific to the striatum. It might be very important to look at cognitive and decision-making tasks very broadly to see if different neural circuits are contributing to different states with the brain having presumably the ability to use these parallel circuits to potentially accomplish the same task. Um, so with that, I would want to very much thank my really awesome lab and also awesome collaborators and alumni. Uh, thank you so much.